turn that one on. Okay. Close that door. Yeah, that should be. Yeah, I don't know what that was about, huh? Okay. Oh, that was the drummer's fault. Okay. I see. Somebody's got to take the rap here. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all right. All right. So how's everybody doing tonight? Very good. It's good seeing everybody. It's good to be here. It's good to be seen by me and seen by you. So um, we are going, as you know, verse by verse through Romans, and we're not going real fast. We're going <laughs> kind of slow, you know. Uh, by the time we get to some of those verses that Pastor Chris uh, was singing, then uh, it's going to be maybe a while, right? Very good song service. I can tell you guys have been practicing. Yeah. Sounded. Oh, that, oh, that wasn't practice? Oh, you did? Oh, yeah? It was good. It was good. All righty. So, yeah. All right. So let's pray. So, Father, we thank you so much just for our Bible study that we can have here, the freedom we have in the United States to, uh, to have a Bible study and put a sign out in our yard. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We just thank you for everyone here. We thank you for the word of grace that builds us up and gives us gives us an um, inheritance in you. We thank you for the word of truth. We just uh, pray uh, special for um, Camille who had a heart attack. Father, we pray and is having some difficulties. Uh, we just pray for her, Lord. Um, uh, married 58 years to uh, Mike Lynch. Just keep her in prayer, Father. We just thank you, Lord, and um, just bless our time now, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, okay, so does anybody remember anything from the last time? As we know we didn't have it last week because I had surgery the day before. So was it two weeks ago? Was it that long ago? Are you sure? Oh, you're right. No, it's been two weeks. You're right. It's been two weeks because we missed last week. So we're kind of getting into a section here that's very interesting because Romans chapter one, uh, we know that Romans is the most complete explanation of the um, uh, gospel in uh, it is the most complete explanation of any New Testament book of the um, uh, gospel of Christ. Because um, it starts out by, if you read it like chapter one, man is unrighteous. Man is, th is, there is no righteousness in man, but only God is righteous. Actually, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith in Romans 1.16. So the righteousness of God, so the righteousness that we have, which the, the word righteousness means that you are right as opposed to wrong, right? That's what righteousness means. That, And so we know that the Bible says that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. That's in Romans 3.23. Um, that's like a quote from maybe Psalm 14, where it says that uh, there is no one good, no, not one. Psalm 14, verse 3, there is no one is good. There is no one who seeks after God in the world. There is no one who's good. There is no one who is righteous, no, not one. No one's righteous, only except for their one, the righteous one, Jesus, because he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him in 2 Corinthians 5.21. So he became sin, and he hated sin, and then we were, we were made righteous, not because we did righteous things. We didn't do righteous works to become righteous. And it talks about, Romans chapter 1 talks about man's um, uh, depravity. Man is totally depraved, like there's no good thing in man, um, as it brings out here. And so let's, let's go back here, starting in verse 20. It says, chapter 1, verse 20, um, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so they are without an excuse." So here it is. God has given creation to testify, as we've told about before, that there is a God. 
that it testifies there is a God. It, Psalm 19 says that heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day into day, day uttereth speech, night into night uttereth knowledge. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So Psalm 19 brings this out. Um, and then it says, like in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things that are seen were not made out of things that do appear. So by faith we understand that. So faith gives us an understanding. We're saved by grace through faith, the Bible says. And we begin to understand because what? We mix faith with the word. Like there's a missing ingredient, right? We, there's truth from the Bible. But if we mix faith with it, then it becomes, then I have understanding. It's like putting two and two together, right? Like we were able to see, we look at creation and we go, well, I, yeah, I put two and two together. There is a creator that made those things, that we have life in us, that this didn't happen by accident. You know, and what it, lo and behold, it says it in the Bible, right? In Genesis chapter one, it says that God formed man out of the out of the dust of the earth, and He breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul, Adam. Um, and so here it is. So let's keep on going. Verse twenty one, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations. Now, what we like to do here is we like to do something that's called exegesis, right? Exegesis means that we look into the original languages and we, we do that to bring out the full meaning of the scriptures. Because we look into here, we start looking into these Greek words and we discover, because I've been like actually reading Romans chapter one in Greek, but I can't read it in Greek as well as I can read in English. So I've read it over and over and over and over again and study the words and memorize some of the some of the words in here because some of the words in Romans chapter one only appear one time in the Bible, which is very interesting. Like the word, for instance, the words became vain is met metaio or something like that. I'm probably saying it, I just butchered that really bad. Met metaio. And it just it means that completely completely void like that is the, there is there is no usefulness in it they became vain in their imaginations kind of like what it says like in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 before the flood happened right that it says that the imagination of their hearts was continuously evil all the time there was nothing like, that, like what their thoughts were all the time of all of the people on the earth it says it was continuously evil all the time says they became vain in their imaginations because when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. They didn't go, well, we, we, obviously there is a God, but they didn't what it, like, give, give worship to God. For instance, they didn't glorify him. You know, they didn't exalt him. It's like there is a God, obviously. And so in our reasoning, you ever just sit down and just like think things sometimes and like reason, like I used to do that when I was a little kid. I used to sit there and just like think, I would sit in a chair and just start thinking. Like, and my dad would come by, he goes, that's weird, man. It's like, because I mean, I just, because my mind was going, I would just like be thinking about things. You ever do that before? And it's like, and, and that's what like, we start thinking about the things of God. Because God has given creation to testify that he exists. And what does the Bible say? That if any man comes to God, he must believe that he is, but that he exists. And he becomes a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. You must believe that you have to believe there is a God first. So that's where faith begins. We believe that there is a God, you know. So we get over that hump. We believe there is a God, and then we start seeking for this God. We start to seek for him because and then what, is God, what does God do? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him because what is the reward is that we find God. Amazing. Um, and so it says they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, this word right here, profess, the word is fasco. Fasco in the Greek. I think it's spelled P-H-A-S-K-O in English. If you were to spell it in English, fasco. And it means to affirm or to, 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 uh, to, uh, to allege. Or um, it could mean to claim to be. They claimed to be wise. 
but was it true what they said? They just claimed to be. We see many things here in the Bible about this that, um, you know, that Jesus, what their accusation was of him is that he claimed to be the son of God, but they didn't believe it. You know, but that was what he claimed to be. What Paul the Apostle, um, he's, he, he affirmed in Acts 25, 19, it says, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition and, the, and of one Jesus, which was dead, of whom Paul affirmed to be alive. In other words, this was Paul's claim that Jesus was alive from the dead, but people didn't necessarily b believe it. It could be true or it could not be true. This is what it means, that they profess themselves to be wise. But see, instead of like professing something that we don't know about, maybe instead of professing, we could confess instead, right? Like, like confess, the Greek word is homologeo, right? Like H-O-M-O-L-E-G-O, -O -E if you're taking notes, homologeo. And it means to speak the same things. Like, for instance, like 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, there it is, we, ale we allege to it, right? We say we have no sin, but we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he's, we are, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it doesn't mean there, like, from the penalty of sin. It means from the guilt, fear, and shame that sin produces. He's faithful and just to, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, like in my heart. Because that's what sin does, right? Like Adam and Eve, they were in the garden. They had what? They had three things. They had fear, they had guilt, and they had shame, right? Because they ran and they hid. They were afraid of God, and they were talking with God every day. And then they went and they hid. They were afraid. They had guilt. They were guilt because of their sin. And that's what sin does. That's what it does for us. But God, Jesus, takes away. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank God. We have no sin. It's cast from the deep, th from the, the east is to the west, into the deepest sea. He's taken away our sins. Amazing. And that's even the fear, guilt, and shame, because if God doesn't remember my sin, why should I remember my sin? You know? It's like God doesn't re he remembers our sin no more. He said it, I will remember your sins no more. It's like, wow, at all? Like, oh, come on, God. You, you got it at the back of your mind, right? You know, I will remember your sins no more. They are paid for in full. That's what it means on the cross. Jesus said, it is finished in John 19.30. It is finished. You know, there's no more work to be done. He did it. It's complete. Um, and the Bible tells us that we are complete in him. Right? We are complete in him. That's what it means. Like, we are in Christ. We are in Christ. This is what we talk about, that being in Christ. And, though, and so it says here, they professed themselves to be wise. They became fools. They became fools. Now, the word here for fools, the word is mor moreno, and it's where we get the word moron. <laughs> you know, literally, like they, they professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, it's in the active voice, professing themselves, because in Greek you have active voice and then you have passive voice, so the opposites of one another. So they profess themselves to be wise, and then they became fools. Passive voice, something that happened to them, you know. It was kind of like what, what we said before. It says that, that they knew God. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. That was something that happened to them. It was in the passive voice. Not something that they did on their own. You see, and this is where the deceitfulness of sin comes from. Hebrews 3.13 says sin is deceitful. It's deceitful. It's foolish and hurtful. I think it's First Timothy. It is foolish and hurtful lust. You know, that's why the Bible tells us not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. Because if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15, right? And then uh, I think it's 1 Timothy 3.4 says that you can be a lover of pleasure rather than or more than a lover of God. And it's kind of like, you know, if you look at the, the great examples like Moses, for instance, right? Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, Moses, it says that he... Um, that he would rather suffer, we can turn there real quick, Hebrews chapter 11, just keep it there. It 
It's in verse 20. Okay, let's see here. In verse 24, verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. We know the story, right? How many know the story of Moses when he was a child that he, that there was that um, that all of the all of the the, the children were going to be killed and Moses was put in the basket and was sent down the river. That's what is actually the name Moses means drawn from the river, right? It means to draw from. And so we know the story, right? Um, it says this was by faith. It says by faith Moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He could have had that. He could have like chose, hey, you know what? I, I know I'm a hero, but look, you know, I get all of this stuff. I get women, I get riches, I get all these things. It says that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So see, there was an exchange that happened. There's an exchange which we're going to get into. It says, esteeming the, ro- the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, what kind of a God is this God? We go back to tr- um, Romans chapter 11, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1. The invisible things of him in Romans 1.20. Right. And Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. We can't see God. He's invisible. The invisible God. Um, And then it says. Verse 23, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man into birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. The word change here is a lasso in the Greek. Alasso, and it means to change one thing for another, like it's to trade, like how, like maybe when you use money, right? You use money to buy something to get something back. There's an exchange that happens. So this is what the, it says here that they exchanged, or they changed, the glory of the incorruptible. What kind of a god is he? Incorruptible. It's aphthartos in the Greek. Aphthartos. Um, and it just means non-perishable. And where else do we see that in the Bible? Maybe some other places, right? How about First Peter one twenty three? It says we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that lives and abides forever. So we are born again of a non-perishable seed. So there is a part in us that lives forever, that has eternal life. Because God has given us eternal life. Now it's our present possession. That's an amazing thing. We are born again of that non-perishable seed by the word of God. When we heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, right? I think it's he, uh, Ephesians 1.14. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. Whenever you heard that, 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 that you believed and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with that spirit. Which meant that like it was a guarantee, like he was a, he's the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit, which is a down payment that guarantees your salvation. Like for instance, like we, we bought this house, we put a down payment on it, which guaranteed that nobody else could come and buy the house. You know, the Holy Spirit is a down payment that guarantees our salvation. It's an amazing thing because we are Christ's purchased possession. Wow, we are his purchased possession. That's an amazing thing to think about. We are bought with the blood of Christ. And when we understand these things, it's like, wow, I've been bought with the blood of Christ. I'm his purchased possession. It's like, wow. And so are the people of God, God's purchased possession. That's why the Bible tells us, you know, uh, Acts 20, 28, to feed the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And it was God's own blood. It didn't say Jesus. It says to feed the flock of God, which he has purchased, which God has purchased with his own blood. Wow. Amazing. Um, and so we, we, we preach these things, we teach them. So they change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto what? Corruptible man 
because man is perishable, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Notice the progression here that begins to happen. It starts from God's highest creation, which was man, all the way down to creeping things, right? Very interesting, isn't it? And it's like the creeping things there, the word is arauto, um, and it's where we get the word reptile. Because like a snake, because there's like worship, there's snake worship. That was something that was big, big time in Egypt, you know, snake worship. But then the pharaohs, they were considered to be gods, but they were humans, you know. But yet they were obviously perishable, right? They were put in, in the, the pyramids, and they were like embalmed and stuff, thinking that they would be resurrected from the dead. You know, this was like something that they believed, like later on, because they believed that they were deity, you know, but 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 that's very interesting that how that that works. So like everything that God has created in the world, instead of like the creator, like they worshipped his the creation instead. And then it says here that um, that um, verse twenty four it says wherefore God gave them up. God gave them up. To now, now it does not mean here. It does not mean that God like. Um, that he did he quits on them because God doesn't quit on anybody. Because the word here is para didomai. Para didomai. Okay? And a para means alongside, and didomai means to give. So it means to give alongside. It means to betray. It means to hand over. So what did God do? He handed them over, he hands them over to their sin, to the thing that they want. Was their sin, and sin caused deception. It's hurtful. Um, you, you cannot you cannot fellowship with sin. You cannot like for a Christian. I can be born again, but I can also be carnal. It's possible, you know. But I can't. I like like sin for the Christian never separates us from our relationship with God, but it separates us from our fellowship with God. It does do that, and it will do that. See, the wages of sin is death. See, there are those that say that this chapter in the Bible right here, that God was punishing them. But I don't think that that's exactly accurate, that he was punishing them. I think that sin is the result of, like this is the result of sin. This is what happens. This is what sin does. And so God just gives them over to the in sin, which causes destruction and deception. It does its work. It works it out. That's what it does. It's the law of sin and death. You know, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Right? Romans 8, 1. So, and, it's, and, and that's what it does. The wages of sin is death. And the word death there, the word is necros. And necros never means annihilation, but it means separation. Just like when we die, we're separated from our body. And if you're absent from the body, where are you at? You're present with the Lord. Right? Hallelujah. That's a promise for the Christians. If you're born again, if you're absent from the body, you're not like you don't cease to exist. You're present with the Lord. That's what the Bible says. We believe that. Right. And we know that we'll get a new body one day because the Bible also says that it promises that in First Corinthians 15, that we will get a new body and it will be non-corruptible, non-perishable. It will be a fathartos, non-perishable body. Very interesting. Just like Jesus, right? Jesus, like because he was God, like death could not hold him. That's why he was resurrected from the dead. His death couldn't hold him. He had to be resurrected from the dead. Plus the fact that he said it all the time. You know, he, he preached about it, that he was going to be resurrected from the dead. And his disciples were like, what? You know, uh, what did he just say? You know, but yet they did understand later. They did understand it, which was the testimony that they didn't steal the body, you know, and like, go hide it somewhere, otherwise they would, uh, you know, and try to start this, oh, let's start a worldwide religion. You know, it's like, no, I, that wasn't what was going on. You know, so um, it says that God gave them up, paradidomai, so in verse 24, to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. Where does sin begin? What does it say in James? You know, they, they, it starts from your own lust. Like sin starts with lust, and when it, con it when it's conceived, it has, how does it go? When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. 
Where's that at? I know it's in James somewhere, right? First chapter, yeah. And that's what it does. That's, that's the effects of it. That's what it does. And it was because of the lust of their own heart. It was what was inside of them. Um, it says to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. In verse 25, they changed the truth of God. Once again, they changed the truth of God into a lie. Huh. How did they do that? Change the truth of God into a lie? Because the nature testifies of the things of the truth of God. And whenever something is against nature, then it must not be true. It must be something must be wrong with it. You know, something is wrong. Because nature says, this is correct. God created a male and a female, created, created he them. Male and female. You know, it's like, and when the two come together, they become one flesh. You know, that is the truth of the Bible. And we see that in nature, even. So anything contrary to that is contrary to nature, so it must be contrary to God, who created all these things. Because the, those, the invisible things of him, of him from the, fr the, the invisible things, right? Like, number one, like, what does it reveal? Like, that God is invisible, because it's the invisible things of him, right? Um, the invisible things of him, number one. Um, also, that, let's see here, where are we at here? So they're invisible, oh yeah, the invisible things of him, the eternal things, that God is eternal, also in verse 20, right? And then also, that God is incorruptible, God is non-perishable, the non-perishable, like these are the attributes of God that we begin to see and we reveal through like progressive revelation. Right, and what is progressive revelation? That like God has progressively revealed Himself throughout all of the centuries, just like Job. Like there was no Bible or anything when Job was around, but yet somehow Job knew things about God, and even though he wasn't correct, a hundred percent, right? He but there was still knowledge there about God. God came in and tested him to correct it. So he would understand, and that's what testing does for us. Um, so they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Isn't it interesting? Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Second Corinthians four four, Colossians one fifteen. Right, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus said, "If you've seen me, you've seen my Father." It's like wow. So like God is invisible, but how do you see him? Right? You know, the Bible says that uh, no man has seen God at any time. Right? John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time. But the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And that word declared, the word is ex hegeomai. And that's where we get the word exegesis. I love saying that. I'll say it 10,000 times. <laughs> It's where we get the word. We've said it many times. That's why I say it. Huh? Has it been? You counted? Yeah. So <laughs> could be 10,001. So, yeah, but exegesis is like he's the exegesis. He's the full description of God. He's the image of the invisible God. That's an amazing thing, you know. But yet the image here, the word icon, you know, like an image is not the real thing, is it? You know, except that Jesus is, like he is God. It's the amazing thing, but he, what, he reflects his father. He shows his father. That was the image that he was showing, the image of God, his father, the God the Father. Um, and so that's an amazing thing. And then he gives us the Holy Spirit who, what, shines the light on Jesus, Christ in us. And then Jesus shows us the Father. It's kind of the way it works. Not kind of, but it is the way it works. So it says, God gave them up, verse 24, to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between them who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And so it says here, number one, worshiped like to honor God, sabo my, I think it is, and served like latrino, I think it is, means service and worship, like 
you know, it means to serve to through service in worship. It says that that um, serve the creature more than the creator. Now, the word more than the word is para. Para, and it means alongside. Para means alongside, right? Parallel, you know, it means alongside. So, in other words, it's kind of like there was a choice to be made. Creator, creature. Creator, creature. Let's worship the creature instead of the creator. It was like they looked around the creator and looked at the creature and worshiped the creature instead whenever the creator was right there. And it was obvious, like, who should be worshipped? The creator. You know? So, um, is this making sense so far? So, they, they, they worshipped and served the creature more than the word para, the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Because he's blessed forever, because he's the one who will be worshipped forever. And the book of Revelation says that there are angels in that, that will be there that will nonstop day and night praise God for, for like night and day. That is an amazing thing when we think about that. I mean, what is worship anyway? Like, what do you think it is to worship? Yeah. Honor, respect. Like, it's whatever is on your mind. Like it's whatever is uh, is that whatever you love, is what you worship. You know, if we love the world, I can't love God too, because the Bible says, "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world." If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is on him. And then it goes on to describe it, right? First John two fifteen, it says, "For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, is what not of the Father. It's not of the Father because sin is not of the Father." And so now because we have the Holy Spirit in us, now we have an ability now to actually, not only are we positionally righteous, but I can walk righteously. Because the Bible says walk in the Spirit. And what, what's the result? You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yeah, Galatians 5.16. Those that are after the flesh, do you mind the things of the flesh? Those that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. And so the Bible teaches us we know things that the world has no idea about. But it's interesting because have you ever, like, talked to people before and they're like, yeah, like the Bible, it was, it was like, changed so many times and it was written by so many different people and it's like, we can't believe it and things like that. It was like, have you ever read the Bible? No, I mean, you know, well, yeah, I read it or whatever. But, I mean, it's like, I mean, but they didn't really, like, look to see if this was true or not. You know, because if they did, if they were serious about it, God would have revealed the truth to them. You know, those people that are like that. You know, and they what? They changed the truth of God into a lie. We're going to keep on. Let's read a little bit more here. We're just going to read it to the end, and then we're going to stop just to get the full thought here. But we're going to continue on with this next week. Um, it says, um, verse 26, for this cause, this cause, God gave them up. Paradidomai unto vile affections, for even their women did exchange the natural use unto that which is against nature. Okay, we won't explain that right now just because we're running out of time. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use or function, okay, uh, of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense, those were that recompense of their error, which was meat. Okay, so that's King James' terminology there. And in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. So there it is again. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. And then it says, and being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Wow. Disobedient to parents. 
without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. And so, and so all these sins that are listed out here, this is what the result of it means to be without God. This is the result of being without God is. The world that is without God. You know, uh, because it says here, I think I might have missed some things here that, we had, that I should have talked about. Um, let's see here. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Okay. God gave them over to uncleanness to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So we'll pick up with verse 26 next time. So amen. All right. So we'll, act, we'll open this up for questions and comments, et cetera.